Okay, it's, it, it has been said that turbulence is the last uh, great uh, unopened problem of classical physics. And it certainly is, well, one of the last, let's put it like that. And uh, it certainly is an old problem in the sense that the equations we shall be able to govern it go back uh, more than 150 years. So in that sense, it's maybe not such an outrageous uh, prediction that maybe in the next visions conference 100 years from now, it might still be discussed, who knows. Anyway, uh, the problem of turbulence uh, in a very few words is how come these equations, this simple partial differential equation, simple looking partial differential equation here, how come it have as its consequences uh, uh, the complicated motions you observe in waterfalls or tornadoes uh, uh, and so on. Uh, now, they, uh, what we have here is an equation for motion of a fluid. So fluid here means you can think about air or water or liquids or gases of that type. And uh, we describe that uh, uh, motion by a vector field. So we are in RD. D physically is 3 or 2. So we have a vector field in some region, which uh, sometimes I take uh, bounded, sometimes unbounded for the mathematical study. Uh, and uh, the vector field is time dependent, and that vector field has some dynamical equation, which is called the Navier-Stokes equation. And that equation is, uh, is a very simple equation from conceptual point of view. It's just Newton's law written for the fluid element. So, U means the velocity of the water at point X where you are sitting and observing it at time T. So you are just looking at, there, at the water going past and you measure the velocity at that point at, at various times. Uh, and that satisfies this equation. And the equation ha is of the form acceleration, I mean derivative of velocity with respect to time. Acceleration equals force. Uh, there is a term, this nonlinear term, which comes from the fact that you are sitting, sitting and watching the motion, uh, motion of the fluid instead of being moving with a fluid element. So that's a natural thing which naturally occurs there. Uh, there are forces which the fluid nearby fluid elements uh, uh, exert on, on, on the little one which we are looking at. That's called pressure. So the change, the gradient of the pressure enters as a force. Then you have some external force. So you are mixing coffee in the coffee cup, and the external force is the motion of your spoon in the coffee cup. Uh, and finally, the only non-obvious term is the frictional force uh, coming from the internal friction of the fluid from statistical mechanics, eventually irre irreversible processes taking place. And in Navier-Stokes equation, that frictional force is modeled by the Laplacian. So, and there is a coefficient, which is called the viscosity. So that's the equation. And with uh, a little additional uh, condition, uh, we are discussing incompressible fluid mo flow, which is very good approximation in, in many, many practical uh, cases. All right, so viscosity, that's uh, <coughs> the friction. The pressure in the case of uh, 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 incompressible flow is actually uh, function of the velocity, so it's not an independent term. So that's the partial differential equation. And before, well, what, what I want to do, I want to explain you, try to convey at least how the problem of turbulence could be posed mathematically, and then tell you a little bit about recent, uh, during the five, past five years, understanding of similar problems, not in this equation, but in a related equation. All right, so to understand, we have to first understand what sort of situations we are after. So let, here are three pictures of experimental setups uh, where you study uh, turbulence in laboratories. Uh, this is supposed to be a two concentric cylinders. I'm looking from up. Uh, the internal, uh, the cylinder inside is stationary, it doesn't move, and the outer wall is rotating. So as a consequence, it's in inducing a motion to the liquid in between. Usually they do vice versa, they rotate in the Yeah, very good. <laughs> I put the arrow here and I didn't want to erase it anymore. 
Anyway, whatever you do, uh, in this system there is some characteristic length, namely the, the, the size of this system in this case. The size where uh, you do nothing here and, and you do something the distance L from that. Uh, there, are, there is another case uh, 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 of interest. Uh, imagine a body, uh, uh, a ball or a cylinder, let's put a ball for instance, and you send, uh, so it's, it's, it's sort of stationary in the space, and you, s you send fluid with constant velocity to the direction of that ball. So something happens, then the fluid has to go around, and something happens on, on the right-hand side, uh, <coughs> depending on the velocity and on the size of the ball. Uh, then there's maybe one, one more thing to sort of think, think, think in, uh, keep in mind. Uh, to produce something which is more homo homogeneous in space, you put a sieve or, or a grid. You can, if you smoke, you can just take a sieve and, uh, and blow through the sieve, and the smoke creates creates um, creates this, uh, some some turbulent motion. So again, here there is a characteristic scale, which is the uh, distance between those those holes. All right. So once you think about Keep keep that that sort of picture for a moment in mind. So we are interested in in or the coffee coffee cup. You are mixing the coffee with a spoon of certain characteristic size. All right. So uh, what is the phenomen phenomenology of of this? Before I go to any further, let's see what one sort of wants to do here and observes. Now it's a nonlinear equation. Otherwise, that's a nonlinear term here, and. Uh, and uh, you should think about this is a term sort of like an engine, which is doing something. There's no linear term, and there is a break uh, by the viscosity. And sort of the relative size of those two effects is an important thing. The ratio of the nonlinearity to the breaking, the viscosity, it's called Reynolds number. Now, you have to be a little bit careful here. How do you, how do you define that? There are some symmetries of this equation. There are obvious scale symmetries. You multiply times, uh, uh, times and uh, distances by, by numbers, and then you have to uh, multiply the velocity, which is meters per second also, with, with similar uh, uh, cons consistent ratios. And the equation stays invariant. Uh, there's another symmetry, which is the Galilean invariance, which means that uh, uh, you can always go to a moving frame const with constant velocity. If, you're, if your fluid is moving everywhere with constant velocity, obviously shouldn't be of, uh, uh, you shouldn't count that as, as a high, high size of the velocity field. So only differences of velocities are important here. You can always go to the moving frame of the constant motion fluid, and then it looks nothing is happening. OK, so the Reynolds number is a certain rela uh, <coughs> ratio of the velocity, size of the nonlinearity here, to the viscosity. But you have to take the velocity difference, and then you have to put some powers of, of the scale, which is here, in order to make something which is uh, invariant under these symmetries. So that's a, that's a definition. You could take the, uh, the definition in these examples. The velocity difference is just uh, the v here minus the v there, which is 0. So the v uh, in all these cases, and the l is the l here and then viscosity is viscosity. Maybe more mathematically, you might take something like the Sobolev norm, first Sobolev norm in the, in the region where you are, uh, multiplied by appropriate powers of, of L. But so think about the Reynolds number in, in these examples in those terms. Then what you observe is the following. Uh -huh. Leave that. All right, so when the, when the Reynolds number is small, less than something order unity, uh, you have a regular flow. Nothing interesting is happening. Uh, it's called laminar flow. Uh, when you start increasing the Reynolds number, so it means either changing this L or the nu or the delta U or all, all, the, all of them in, in definite fashion, uh, you get bifurcations and, and finally uh, the flow becomes increasingly complicated and finally, in some sense, chaotic. And finally, once the Reynolds number is very large, bigger than 10 to 2, 
uh, you get a very peculiar chaotic behavior which has the name turbulence. Uh, in, the, in the limit of very large Reynolds number, 10 to 6, 10 to 7, which is not large if you think about, it's very easy to have 10 to 7 in, in, uh, in air, just in regular, regular circumstances already, or, or, or in water. Uh, when it becomes very large, uh, one observes universality in the sense of the talk of Tom, Tom Spencer. Uh, namely, certain things which will come in a moment uh, uh, become independent of the nature of the forcing. Okay, so you can change the details of the forcing uh, and, uh, and you observe the same phenomena, same numbers actually. Okay, so what about on the mathematical level? This is a nonlinear, you can view it as, well, it is a nonlinear parabolic uh, partial differential equation, actually an integral partial differential equation because of this, this relation here. Anyway, it's a nonlinear PDE and, and uh, the math mathematic, uh, at least during the past 20, 30 years, most of mathematical studies on this equation have really been PDE studies of it. So it, the, the, in, the, in that framework, you are interested in improving the existence of solutions and study existence, uniqueness, smoothness of solutions. This goes back to, uh, to a long time ago already. It was Lorraine in 1933 uh, who proved in, in three dimension uh, global existence of solutions, not uniqueness and not smoothness. They are weak solutions. So distributional solutions of this equation. They are, all you know about them is that they are L2. It's for Navier-Stokes. For Navier-Stokes. Nu is positive here. Very it's very important. I will come in a moment what happens when nu goes to zero, but at the moment it's nu is positive, un unless otherwise stated. Uh, so Lerre proved the global existence of weak solutions and uniqueness uh, uh, he couldn't prove and, uh, and ever since it has been open. Uh, if the Reynolds number defined in whatever way you want to define it here uh, uh, for the initial data is finite, uh, then uh, a smooth solution exists, but for a very short time, time going to zero, for Reynolds number going to infinity. I mean, it's proven to exist. It's not a claim of, of, of whether it ex really exists. Strong means smooth, yes. Basically, you should think about that uniqueness in this case means smooth. Once, it, once you prove that it's unique, then it will become smooth. Uh, this, uh, my, uh, my question is, the thickness of solution, uh, does it allow infinite amount in, uh, value of uh, particularity? Or just is it just in this case, uh, the weak solution, okay, let me say what it, mean, what it says. It says that I integral u squared is finite, and integral gradient u squared over space and time is finite. So it, in, uh, vorticity can be infinite. Can be. Can be infinite, but then uh, the, the set of uh, space-time points where it's infinite to get bound for that and its Hausdorff dimension is not too no, big. Integrable singularities. Integrable singularities in the L square sense of the vorticity in space and time. In space, you know nothing about the integrability of the vorticity. But then, uh, okay, well, maybe, okay, you are the chairman, but nevertheless, maybe we could uh, leave for discussion <laughs> some things. Uh, because that's not what I'm intending to talk about at all. There's another approach within the mathematical and, of course, in the physical community, but that was started also by, in a serious way, by, in the mathematic, by a mathematician named Nikola Mogorov. And uh, that's the statistical theory. And here the idea is that, well, okay, so the main concern, let's go back to that, the main concern here, here uh, at the moment, or for the past 20 years, within the uh, PD people has been the question whether solutions blow up in three dimension. Uh, and that has been a difficult question, and the more you look at it, the, uh, the more it seems to be difficult, at least when you interview the people who are involved. Uh, nevertheless, it's fair to say that it's pretty far from what physicists have been interested in turbulence, this blow up of solution in three dimensions. And the thing which is closer to those concerns and the real turbulence issue is the statistical theory. So what do you want to do here? 
Well, here you want to focus on typical, not individual solutions. So what do we want to mean by typical? Well, everybody knows from dynamic assistance what you want to mean by that. This is a dynamical system, first derivative in time. So what do you have? You have a dynamical system in, this, in some space of vector fields of your region omega. All right? Well, provided you can prove, of course, existence of solutions. Now, uh, <coughs> think about it as a dynamical system, then, uh, uh, then what you would be interested in is an invariant, ergodic invariant measure of the dynamical system. If you had such a thing, then you would know that uh, the time averages of suitable observables uh, would be the same things as the, if you wish, the snapshot averages, the averages over just snapshots of the fluid at given times in the invariant measure. So time average is the same as the average over the invariant measure. This time, so it doesn't know, know about time. Now, again, from ordinary finite dimensional dynamic systems, you know what the natural measures is. They are the ones which are stable under a little, little uh, addition of noise, so the ones which put noise in. <coughs> so that's an alternative approach to turbulence. And uh, to formulate uh, really a mathematical model and, and question, about that, let me do it now. Uh, what, uh, ever since from Kolmogorov, people have been thinking about uh, as a model of, of an idealized turbulence, not a turbulence of an engineer who wants to plan the plane, the wing of the plane, but the turbulence of the theoretical physicist and the mathematician who wants to address the question of universality. That model could be stated, for instance, as follows. You take uh, uh, this force here, random, stationary in x and t, so it's translation invariant in x and in time, and you take it in scale L. So you think about your spoon, which you are mixing the coffee, but uh, it's the size is L, but otherwise you're doing it randomly. And, uh, <coughs> and no prejudice as, as far as where you are in the, in the cup, etc. Uh, for instance, you could take a Gaussian, and that's uh, mostly what in the mathematical literature have been studied. Gaussian noise uh, um, with a certain covariance. Never mind too much about that. Basically, you want the, uh, the noise to be concentrated on scale L, so the, the covariance function of the noise in its Fourier transform should be localized near uh, K inverse, uh, L inverse. Okay, so take such a model. That's a perfectly well-defined uh, stochastic partial differential equation, and you can ask about questions uh, about the solutions of the equation. Now, what do you know mathematically? Of course, again, almost nothing. In three dimension, uh, you know that. Uh, weak uh, statistical solutions exist. Again, parallel to the, the case of the deterministic problem. Weak solutions exist in two dimension. Uh, uh, remember, we had existence and uniqueness of, uh, of solutions. And here, you have existence of invariant measure, but not with assumptions which we are interested in, namely the turbulent assumptions. Although I don't think that's, that should be a difficult problem to actually prove that there is a, there is a unique invariant measure. Now, uh, uh, so that's, of course, the ba basic thing what you want, would like to do. But the thing you're really interested in is after you have the unique invariant measure. So let, let's talk a little bit about, about, uh, about what one really expects. Okay? This invariant measure is experimentally accessible. You look at time series, you measure the uh, the velocity at, at, a, at a given point in various instances of time, you take the time average. Or you take photographs of various realizations of the flow at given time. Uh, and you can calculate these averages of, in the invariant measure. These things, either this side or that side. And that people do experimentally all the time. So the ups, upshot sort of, of those experiments could be perhaps stated in the following fashion. There seems to be exist a length scale in addition to the length scale L, which our spoon was 
doing, eta, let me call it eta, and that scale goes to zero as the Reynolds number goes to infinity. So if you take the viscosity to zero, that scale becomes microscopic. And what happens is that the invariant measure ex exhibits scale invariance on, the, on those scales. Scale invariance in the same sense as in the lecture of Spencer. So let's look at a couple of examples. Uh, the first example call, uh, goes under the name energy spectrum. So measure just the correlation function, exactly like the spin, spin correlation function which uh, Spencer was dealing with. Velocity at point x and velocity at point y. The stationary homogeneous, so the average of u should be zero, and you look at how they are correlated at, at uh, different points. So I, I use this notation that the, um, uh, the bracket means the average over the invariant measure, which experimentally is given by either of those uh, formulae. Uh, well, if, if you are stationary in x, translation invariant, that's a function of x minus y, and you can look at its Fourier transform. And what you observe is the following. This Fourier transform has the following behavior. It has a pure power law, more or less equal to k to power minus 11 over 3. So this is the transform of the correlation Exactly. Fourier transform of the correlation function. It has a peculiar power. That's not exactly ac accurate, this 11 over 3, but uh, seems to be pretty good uh, experimentally. 11 over 3. And this holds in the sense of Spencer, this t d tilde here. Uh, there's a constant which is not universal, etc. Uh, but this power seems to be within, well, uh, at least it's believed, and, uh, <coughs> or hoped. And uh, there is, um, this holds when k is between this, k inverse is between the, this small scale and the large scale. But the constant is pretty well known. Uh, experimentally. Mm. 2.1 epsilon and 2. I'm sorry? These are physical experiments in three dimensions. There are no reliable computer experiments in three dimensions. In two dimensions there are, but not in three. All right. So there is an energy density. Uh, velocity squared is the energy, kinetic energy. You are homogeneous in, in X, so it doesn't depend on X. And, and you can, we can write it from this formula, putting x to y as an integral over, over what one calls wave numbers, the, num the, the absolute value of the Fourier transform variable k. And then you can ask how much energy there is for various scales in, in the momentum space. Well, that's a simple, just add k, d minus 1 to that in, in three dimension. So you see the following sort of behavior. Energy in scale k is, uh, is proportional to k to the power minus 5 thirds. And it goes very quickly to zero as k becomes very small, uh, large when you are in the ultraviolet. So you expect that the energy stays finite even as the viscosity goes to zero. This integral is convergent at large k, if that's the correct behavior. When viscosity goes to zero, eta goes to zero. So the, you don't have any decay there, but this is enough. Whereas the gradient of u seems to diverge, because gradient has an extra k squared, and so you get a positive power of k, and it certainly doesn't seem to converge as viscosity goes to zero. So that's one consequence of these experimental observations. Now, um, there's more to it. Uh, there's a whole picture now about what the nature of the stationary state is. Uh, after all, the energy is conserved if you don't have the friction. That's the Euler equation. Uh, so there is certain reflection of that in our stationary state. And you can write an equation, what happens to the energy if you are a stationary state. You write an obvious Stokes equation, and you get that zero is a sum of two terms. Nonlinearity doesn't uh, count at all, and, and you have it, something which is proportional to the viscosity, which you call the energy dissipation, and something which is proportional to the force, which is energy pumping. And if that's zero, those two balance each other, and that's uh, something which, well, it's called the energy balance. And, uh, and again, if we believe in these powers here, 
if you look at the dissipation of energies, then it seems to be taking place mostly close to the small scale eta, it's k squared, k to positive power. So this is dominated by something happening in the small scales. And the pumping of energy, because I put the force in the large scales, happens there. So you have the picture that you put energy in, in the spoon size, then it sort of just flows without any, anything happening to it in scales, creates more and smaller mo motions in scale, and finally gets killed by the dissipation in this very small scale if the Reynolds number is large. So that's a sort of a picture which, uh, which you infer from these experimental observations and, uh, and this simple equation which the stationary state should satisfy if it existed. So th this is the cascade picture of Richardson Kalvagorov. Constant flux of energy in, in momentum space from injection scale to dissipation scale. That's the official picture of turbulence, uh, or what at least one would like to perhaps, well, if, if, if forced to bet, uh, but to be true. All right, so what, what does it mean? Let's look at it a little bit more, what it means. Uh, in particular, this thing is fixed. It's just the amount of energy you put in. I'm not doing anything. I'm just keeping the spoon. I'm changing the viscosity, I'm changing it from water to something, alcohol or whatever. Uh, and uh, I'm pumping the same energy. So it has to stay the same as this. So what has to happen is that this limit is non-zero, because it's just given by, by the pumping. So in particular, well, as we observed already before, uh, <coughs> Uh, the gradient u squared has to become infinite in the limit of viscosity goes to zero. People usually call that dissipative anomaly. This goes to infinity, this goes to zero, and together they leave some trace. Uh, how we should interpret that mathematically? We should interpret it perhaps in the following way. As you take viscosity to zero, the stationary measure of the Navier-Stokes equation should be concentrated. Well, when viscosity goes to zero, you get the the so-called Euler equation, it should be concentrated on dissipative weak solutions of Euler equation. Euler equation naively concerns, concerns, conserves energy. There is no friction. But what you get when you, once you take the Reynolds number to infinity, you should get some invariant measure of the Euler equation sitting on dissipative weak solutions of it. Now, there's various things which you can do with, with this one-thirds. Uh, uh, <coughs> Heuristically, it's very, very easy to see that you should expect the velocity to be more or less Helder continuous with exponent one-third. And indeed, it's a theorem. Uh, 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 well, in certain cases, in two dimensions, that it can't be more than that. But that, well, let's leave it flat. Uh, at, at that, uh, the expectation is that the velocity is a little bit rough. Uh, Helder continuous, not uh, differentiable. In two dimension, let me say a couple of words. When did I exactly start, by the way? Any idea? At 20 past, or what was it? OK. Uh, uh, in two dimension, there is a little bit um, different picture. Uh, now the observation is that the energy spectrum goes like k to power minus 3 and not minus 5 halves. So various things change here. First of all, the energy, this integral is negligible around the ultraviolet here. Uh, not this one, but where is it? Uh, the energy. It converges very well at k going to infinity, k minus 3. So there's no dissipation of energy at scale, at the short scales. So energy doesn't, get, doesn't do at all the same thing as in three dimension. However, in two dimension, there is another conserved quantity of the Euler equation. In addition to energy, there is so-called entropy, which is basically just related to gradient of u squared, actually the rotation of u, which is called vorticity of the velocity field. And that thing is conserved by the Euler flow. And you can do exactly the same story as, uh, as was done here. There is an entropy um, balance Entropy is dissipated and created, and you can do the same 
uh, calculations as was done in energy. And you get the picture that the entropy now Entropy is now dissipating at scale, short scales. The gradient of the U is doing that. There's a, again cascade of entropy. It's called the uh, direct cascade in, in the jargon of turbulence. So entropy is going in. You put in this uh, conserved quantity. It goes, doesn't change until it reaches the dissipative scale, and then it gets uh, dissipated. Well, what happens to energy? Well, uh, uh, what happens ex experimentally now is that there is another range. And this, these experiments are, uh, this is numeric, this is real experiment, very accurately k to minus 3. And this is a numeric, completely reliable numerical experiment. You can do this in computer in two dimension. Again, very accurate, accurately minus 5 thirds. Uh, <coughs> Both are quite recent, last year, actually. Uh, there is an inverse cascade of energy. Well, if you look at this, now the energy, the integral diverges at small k, right? If I integrate this over k, one-dimensional k, it blows up at k equals zero, which means in x space large distances. So now the energy wants to go to the large distances. There is nothing, if there is nothing to dissipate it there, in the large distances, then it just keeps on growing. And what you expect, actually, in such a case is that there is no stationary state for the velocity, only for the gradients of velocity. One is very familiar with such a situation in statistical mechanics, for instance, uh, quantum fields in two dimension. Uh, <coughs> again. Uh, but if, if, if you have boundaries in the, re uh, if you, for instance, have a finite volume, if you are in torus and you have a constant velocities uh, present in the system, then the energy can go to those constant velocities and increase linearly in time. OK, so that's, that, that's the experimental sort of abstraction of what, the, what the people have, of course, been doing experimentally long time. But nowadays, at least in two dimensions, this is pretty, in pretty good uh, control. There's another thing in the scale invariance, very striking and very important. And let me spend two, one minute on that. It's, it's the phenomenon of so-called intermittency. One expects not only this scaling of the two-point function, but a whole range of scaling exponents, Helder exponents, a spectrum of Helder exponents, actually. You look at something, if you were to look at Helder continuity, you look at uh, u at x and u at 0. And take, that's a vector, to, so take it parallel to, to the distance, the vector from x to 0. And look at moments of this random variable for various x's. They seem to scale again when x is between those two scales with certain powers. And all these powers seem to be non-trivial, not multiples of each other, like uh, the so-called Kolmogorov theory from 50, 60 years ago predicted. They are pretty good approximation for small n. They are given by n over 3, but not exactly. And they, they seem to be all different, a concave function, not a linear function of n. This phenomenon is called uh, multiscaling or intermittency. I'm not going to explain the name of the, what, what, what it means, this word. But the, let's, our definition be just that there are this whole spectrum of Helder exponents. It seems that you are not dealing with a function which has is Helder continuous with high probability of certain degree, but it has has a whole spectrum of Helder continuity properties. Uh, in two dimension, again, some very striking difference. Uh, for short distances, scale, uh, it seems to be OK. I mean, uh, differentiable in some sense, uh, whereas for large distances, the same as in three dimension, uh, like in Komogorov theory, but exact. Even the up to, up to log, what I put here, doesn't seem to be there experimentally. OK, that finishes the introduction. OK, so what I want to say is 
Let me repeat the main expectations we have on Navier Stokes, the cascade picture of energy, the dissipative anomaly, the measure sitting on weak dissipative solutions of Euler equation as uh, Reynolds number goes to infinity, and this intermittency. Yes, it's very important. They will be non-unique. It's important they are non-unique, actually. The whole ensemble of solutions contributes. Now what I want to describe is that there is a model where all these things actually happen, and not so unrelated to Navier-Stokes. Cascade picture dissipative anomaly and intermittency, and measure sitting at weak solutions, a whole ensemble of them. Well, the motivation of this uh, model is the following. Look at turbulence again, and let's look at this vorticity which I mentioned already. That's the curl of the velocity. In two dimensions, it's just this combination here. Uh, it's advected by u. What do I mean by advected? Well, you just plug in the, write the Navier-Stokes equation for that, and it satisfies these two equations depending on the dimension. That's the commutator of the vector fields. Uh, as you see, if you didn't have any viscosity or forcing, then what happens is, is that uh, you are just transporting the omega. It's a scalar, in, uh, or pseudo-scalar, in, uh, in two dimension, and, and it's just transported like a scalar by a diff diffeomorphism. In three dimension, it's a vector, and again, uh, it's translated like a vector by a diffeomorphism. So you generates a time one uh, time-dependent set of diffeomorphisms, and those omega is just transported by those. Now, uh, it's a natural question now to study what happens in general if you have somebody gives you a turbulent velocity, uh, how does it tend to tr uh, transport scalars, vectors, things like that? To study such equations where u and omega are not directly related, like here. That, has, of course, from the point of view of applications, that has uh, uh, Im uh, uh, huge importance if you think about, uh, say, say, pollution in groundwater due to toxic waste flowing. You want to, you want to study, study. That's, that's a particular case of, of advection of a passive scalar, namely the equation we are studying. OK, so just a couple of words about what is here. Uh, so let's look at, uh, instead of the Navier-Stokes equation, we have omega here. Let me put, instead of omega, a scalar and look at an equation where I have uh, just linear equation for t, but I have a u here, which I will, in a moment, specify what I want it to be. So there is diffusion, there is transport, there is a source. Now, if I have no diffusion, and no source, then T is just transported. That's undergraduate PD, right? T at time T and, uh, and uh, point X is just what it used to be uh, on the trajectory which reaches from time S to time X. It's just what it used to be here. That's called the method of characteristics, right? That's simple enough. So that's a transportation. If you add a little bit of diffusion to it, not much changes. Instead of looking at the uh, differential equation, uh, you put, uh, look at stochastic differential equation. You add a little Brownian motion. So you have the same equation, but your velocity gets a little Brownian addition. So instead of having a deterministic unique trajectory, like in the case of smooth vector fields, you have a fuzzy trajectory. Instead of having a single solution, you have an ensemble of solutions. You have a Markov process in R&D. Okay? That Markov process has a transition probability, of course, nothing else than the heat kernel of the operator, which is here. And uh, t at time t is given by, well, just by integrating, integrating with the, the, the transition probability kernel of the Markov process of t at time s. Pretty undergraduate, too. Now, what about, um, well, once you add the source, again, linear, uh, ordinary linear differential equations, not only you transport from time s to time t, but you also create all the time during your 
trajectory mole t. Okay, now let's, let's, let me now tell you what, is, what we want to do. We would like to ask, how does a typical turbulent velocity uh, transport this t? Well, we don't know what is a typical turbulent velocity, so let's put, make a question a little bit simpler. It turns out that it's still uh, complicated and actually has comp uh, interesting consequences. So I will take the typical, I will take a, a, a Gaussian velocity. I take a stationary Gaussian random field, uh, with her, which is held or continuous in X, like I expect in turbulence, with some exponent. Helder continues with some exponent. In turbulence, it has a certain value, which we expect. Uh, here, I just take it as a parameter. And uh, white noise in T. So every time step, you sort of change it, the velocity. And uh, what happens now is the following. Then you put, again, a sauce, like the spoon in the coffee cup, in scale L. You put it white in T. So this is an equation like our Navier-Stokes, except that t is not, not the u, but t is just uh, something else. Uh, and you want to study, again, the invariant measure for t and uh, its properties. Now what happens is a little bit striking. Uh, when the diffusivity is non-zero, we have uh, these fuzzy trajectories. We have the Markov process. If I had a smooth vector field, then obviously, as I take the diffusivity to zero, I would regain a deterministic trajectory. So the Marco transition probability would become a delta function on the trajectory. Well, we are in turbulence not interested in smooth vector fields, but Helder continuous ones. And what happens is actually, so in particular it's not Lipschitz and you don't have uniqueness of solutions necessarily. What happens actually is that once you, for a turbulent U, take this limit of kappa going to zero, you don't regain determinism, you actually, you still retain a Markov process. You still have a full diffusion process. That's the theorem. Yeah, I mean, you know that uh, x dot is square root of x doesn't have unique solution, right? That has many of them. Uh, if I take this uh, stationary Helder thing, it actually has a full set of solutions, and naturally what you, what you get is a Markov process. A, a the solution of the ordinary differential equation, which you can't really show that it has a unique solution, actually is a measure. There is a diffusion process. The solution is a diffusion process. So turbulence is inherently non-deterministic in that sense. Trajectory is diffuse. Identical ident uh, in initial conditions don't have identical consequences, like in chaos. In chaos, they have identical initial conditions have identical consequences, but you have exponential separation of trajectories. Here is not the case. Here they have identical initial conditions have different consequences, and nearby ones diffuse. This is because the vector field is not smooth, but it doesn't imply, the smoothness doesn't imply that you have, non-smoothness doesn't necessarily imply that you have a diffusion process. That happens, but that is by no means completely obvious. It is not precisely diffusion, it's uh, some random process. It is actually super diffusion. Yeah. But it's more or less like diffusion. Okay, consequences. Well, if the trajectory is diffuse, and you are transporting something, then it's sort of obvious that the something is going to diffuse too. And, and what you get actually is that the energy, which I could call energy, it's not physical energy here, but it's the L2 norm, well, just the T squared, which is formally conserved by the Euler limit, the kappa going to zero. It's formally conserved, not so in the rough U. What happens is that you again get an, this energy balance in the stationary state. You get the cascade. So this, this guy, the dissipation will not go to zero as kappa goes to zero. Just like what I was saying, telling you in Navier-Stokes, exactly that thing happens here. Uh, energy is dissipated at small scales. It cascades there. There is a dissipative anomaly. And more importantly, the limit measure 
as kappa goes to zero, is supported on weak dissipative solutions of the corresponding equation. That's like the Euler equation. Formally, it seems to converge t squared, but in reality, it doesn't in this limit. So that part of Navier-Stokes expectations actually happens here. But not only that, also the part of intermittency happens here. It so turns out that the invariant measure for t, uh, let's finally put the constants here also, has the following property. You look at, again, the differences. So you try to measure how Helder continues the t is. Uh, so what you get is that there is some non-universal number when you look at the nth moment of differences of t. There's a non-universal number. There are universal exponents here, which don't depend on the details of the noise, and then corrections depending on the dissipative scale and the, and the L. Okay? And they are not linear. You have infinitely many different exponents. Uh, and, and the way you have, well, I, I have no time to go at all how one gets all these things, but what, what happens is that uh, sort of the rough velocity fielding uh, induces correlations. If you, what, what is if you're, if you're looking at t to power n? You're looking at motion of n fluid particles. Okay, so you have this n diffusion, diffusing particles, and they're diffusing in the same v with this particular uh, u, uh, <coughs> which is, which is uh, statistically inducing correlations to those guys. And uh, this will be actually, actually more or less bound state energies in the motion of n, n fluid particles. So what are the lessons for turbulence from this model? Well, it, so, it shows that, uh, I mean, we didn't, of course, solve turbulence at all. We didn't even put a turbulent velocity. We put in a velocity which is rough, like, like we expect turbulent velocities to be. And we asked, what are the consequences for transport? Turbulence is one, per, one example of transport, but not at all as simple as this one. Nevertheless, even when we put a just a scale invariant velocity in, uh, we get the following thing. We get these fuzzy trajectories, the energy dissipation at zero, zero diffusion limit. We get these dissipative weak solutions, which are important as Reynolds number goes to infinity. And uh, in this particular case, we even see that even if we put a non-intermittent U, so U which doesn't have the spectrum of Helder exponents, we are going to generate this Helder exponent by due to certain correlations in the motion in this rough, rough velocity. So I think uh, these models sort of, if there is any, the interest what is in them is that they are sort of close to Navier-Stokes equation in certain senses. Uh, we can make the similar expectations as, as in Navier Stokes, but you can also prove them here. What are the prospects? I think, I think I'm finished. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, prospects as far as what, should, what could one try to do uh, from the mathematical point of view. Of course, this, these passive advection problems are by no means completely understood everything yet. What I explained to you was, was the advection of the scalar in the simplest situation. One should certainly look more into those. But one should also maybe, in the, in the case of Navier-Stokes rather, to study dissipative weak solutions of Euler equation. People have been doing that, especially Schneerman has been doing interesting work on that. And uh, recently, also, there was a nice paper by Duchamp and Robert studying the dissipative anomaly, which we expect to be there in the weak solutions of Euler equation. Now, as far as so mathematical, mathematics is concerned, I think the most accessible question, and that's by no means without physical interest, is two-dimensional turbulence. Uh, <coughs> Well, one thing what one, one could try to do is to study the inverse and direct cascade deterministically. So you put in some initial condition and you ask what happens 
this was done in other equations, Schrodinger equation by Burgan and Cookson. Uh, at least they, they had some results to the, those directions. It might, might be interesting to look at it in 2D Navier-Stokes in the inverse cascade. Uh, existence and uniqueness of a stationary state should be a problem of statistical mechanics, so perfect for mathematical physicists. Uh, but and the more challenging problem to prove the absence of intermittency. As I told you, there is very reliable experiment in real system, real, not computer, not virtual, but real in the case of uh, direct cascade, the ultraviolet, and uh, computer experiment in the case of the inverse cascade. Both very, re very accurately, uh, well, within the accuracy, but seem to indicate that there is no anomalous scaling. All these exponents are like Kolmogorov, Krishnan predictions are. And if that's the case, then maybe that could be accessible to, to mathematical, mathematical approaches too. So that's, that's a ch certainly a challenge and not clear that, that uh, one can really do it. Uh, another full set of uh, questions go under the name of weak turbulence as pioneered by our chairman. And uh, uh, again, it seems to me that mathematical physicists might have some chance of making a contribution there, because there, in contrast to Navier-Stokes, you really seem to have a per perturbative problem in some sense, some sense at least. So one could uh, perhaps, well, I think one, one should attract a little bit of attention on <coughs> going into trying to do uh, mathematical work also there. Okay, I think it's time to stop. <laughs>